All right, here we are, uh, our study of the book of Genesis, the foundational book or the foundation book of the Bible. This is lesson number four. And the title of this lesson is Old Earth versus Young Earth. All right, in our last lesson we talked about Genesis chapter one, verse one, and we reviewed the idea that the Bible describes in the first verse the creation of the time, space, matter, continuum that is our universe. And I made two you know, general points about this last week, just want to review with you for some who are just kind of taking this class. Scientists and philosophers have described our universe as a thing which is comprised in its essence of three elements. Not, not preachers who say this, Scientists and philosophers say the universe is comprised of time, space, and matter, which also includes energy. And no one actually disputes this. No one says this is wrong, uh, and neither does the Bible. As a matter of fact, the book of Genesis establishes this idea by describing these very elements as they first um, uh, materials that God created which He formed the universe with as we now know it. So the Bible you know, doesn't state it scientifically, it just explains the time element in the beginning, the space element, God created the heavens, and the matter element, He created the heavens and the, and the earth. Now the amazing thing is that Genesis was written long before these concepts were described or analyzed by man. That's the interesting thing. You know, scientists have only come up with that description of the universe in the last couple of hundred years, you know, after observation and study and so on and so forth, time, space, matter. You know. But the Bible described it as time, space, matter 1,500 years before Christ uh, at the hand of Moses. And yet what he says is in perfect harmony with what humans have discovered about the universe thousands of years later. So these people that say, you know, science and the Bible, you know, you can't, it's one or the other. It's not one or the other. They, they do complement each other. The Bible isn't a science book. We don't go to the Bible to learn about science, but it doesn't contradict uh, good science anyways. Uh, another thing that we talked about uh, last week is that in the first verse of the Bible, God provides the information to refute major ideological errors that crept up thousands of years after the events and after the writing of Genesis. I said to you last week, it's as if God knew all of the crazy things that men were going to think up, and in the first verse of Genesis, you know, the first book, the first verse of Genesis, he kind of gives us you know, the way to refute these ideas. So Genesis chapter one, verse one, is not only the foundation of the book of Genesis and the Bible, it's the foundation for our thinking and our perception of God, our perception of the universe, as well as our perception of mankind. Okay, so that's just a little review there, a little going back over the things that we talked about last time. In today's lesson, we're going to review some ideas as to the time of creation and the beginning of the formation of the universe as we know it. So we're going to talk about the age of the earth. Now, there are two positions you can take when trying to determine the age of the earth. You can take the old earth theory. The earth is millions to billions of years old. Or you can you know, take the young earth theory where the idea is that the earth is somewhere between five and 10,000 years old. Now the very old view, that's what we're going to talk about first. The very old view of the earth is held mainly by evolutionists because they believe that matter is eternal. When you ask an atheist you know, or an evolutionist, where does all this come from? Where all this matter come from? Their answer is, well, it was always there. 
And then they say, well, it was always there and then this matter was affected in some way. And usually the way that they're talking about is the Big Bang theory. Some, some, some scientists say there was more than one Big Bang. There was the Big Bang and then there were other bangs that took place. So matter is eternal. There was a Big Bang that affected matter and then through time, lots of time, millions and hundreds of millions of years, and chance, the earth eventually evolved to become what it is today. So you take matter which is eternal, it was always there, somehow there was an explosion of cosmic proportions, and then over hundreds of millions of years through time and chance, okay, we are where we are today. Now, it's important to note that they begin with this theory and then they line up the evidence behind it. And that's exactly the opposite of how science, I'm no scientist, but I think the way science works is first you make the observations of how things are and then you posit your conclusion, your theory. You don't begin with a theory and then try to fit the facts to the theory. You, you begin with the facts and try to, you know, to try to develop a theory that will explain all the facts. Now the basis of their proof, and we're still talking about the old earth theory, is expressed in the geological chart created to represent the development of the earth Throughout the, uh, throughout the ages. Now, this is a, an artist's rendition of the evolutionary model. It's not really how the earth like really is, okay? And I mean, there are any number of these charts, right? There are hundreds of them. I, I chose this one here because it was fairly easy to reproduce and it's quite colorful, but there are all kinds of charts, uh, you know, geological charts like this, but I, they all follow the same premise, however. And so, based on this chart, evolutionists say that life begins or began with simple creatures who died and left fossil records. Fossil records are bone or imprints into rocks. And as life grew more complex, well then, you know, scientists would find more complex fossils uh, that were formed in succeeding layers of rock and mud and so on and so forth. So for example, in the bottom layer of rock, if they were doing an archeological dig you know, and they were looking at the various you know, stratas, you know, uh, they would say when you get to the very bottom, you know, 900 billion to uh, 900 million years to several billion years, when you get to the very bottom, well, what you find down there are the fossils of very simple creatures, one cell creatures. And as you go up, the creatures become more complex. So when you get to the 10 million, you know, uh, the 10 million year zone, then you have more uh, complex creatures um, that you find there. The diagram that is shown here is not really based on what actually has been found anywhere on earth. There's no clear record that reflects this picture has been found you know, by geologists. Geologists will say, well, you know, this is kind of how it is, but it's not exactly how it is. The problem is that this picture and this type of picture used in schools is the image used to describe the evolutionary model, but, here's the big but, it has not been proven by actual evidence in the earth. And so the picture is a nice you know, image to try to explain how evolution works. You know, the simple creatures, we found evidence of them at a very early age in the bottom and the more complex creatures at the top. Okay. But this is just a theory. What happens is that when fossils are found, they're dated according to this theory. Remember I said you start with a theory and you add the facts, so they start with this theory and they add the facts to this theory. Now, there's no clock here, there's no record, 
There's no way to accurately date a fossil beyond 60,000 years. You can't, you, you know, carbon dating is the main way that they do that. Carbon dating can only go back 60,000 years, no, no more than that. Actually, between 58 and 62,000. So if, fi if scientists find a bone or a fragment or a fossil uh, record, they can, through carbon dating, um, they can tell if it's 100 or 500 or 1,000, all the way to 60,000, but beyond that, they can't tell accurately. So what do they do? What they do is anything beyond 60,000 years old, they put it into the category artificially created by this evolutionary model and arbitrarily give it an old date. So with this system, something that is found could just as well be 7,000 years old or 7 million years old. I mean, there's no accurate way to tell beyond a certain number of years in theory. And the things that I was reading in preparation for this class, carbon dating is not an exact science. So the problem with the old age theory of the earth is that there are several inconsistencies both theoretically and observationally with this system. Let's uh, take the theory first. For the earth to be one billion plus years old and for evolution to be the system by which everything came to be what is today, we have to accept as true several theories. The first theory is that something comes from nothing. You have to believe that something can actually come from nothing because when you ask an atheist, an evolutionary person, well, where did this, all of this come from, this matter? They say, well, it came from nothing. Really? This is a problem because, as I've said before, nothing comes from nothing. I mean, scientists use, universally agree on this idea and so do philosophers and every human being that has a lick of sense you can't have nothing and then something concrete come out of nothing. So if this is so, why would we accept this idea as the basis for the origin of our existence? <laughs> Some people say, well, it takes a lot of faith to believe that God you know, created the earth. Really? Well, it takes a whole lot of faith to believe that something can come out of nothing. That really takes a lot of belief. Another theory you have to accept, if you're going to accept the old age, a theory, is that matter is eternal. In other words, if it didn't create itself, some, sometimes say, well, no, it didn't, it didn't create itself, nothing could come from nothing, so then you press a little bit and say, well, where did it come from? Well, it was always there. Really? Yep, it was always there. And there's no way, you know, I've heard, uh, I've heard scientists, some scientists say, you know what, this problem is so deep that we shouldn't even try to examine it, let's just accept it as reality. Imagine that, and they say we're crazy. They say we're the ones that you know, have this crazy faith. Simple observation, of course, demonstrates that matter is not eternal. I mean, fire uses up energy, and we all know that we're becoming less than we were. I tell my kids all the time, I'm not the man I used to be. I'm getting worn out. Stars burn up, don't they? So if things have an end, logically they must also have a beginning. You can't say matter is eternal and then watch matter be destroyed. So matter, if it has an end somehow, has a beginning. It comes from somewhere. All right, another theoret uh, theoretical problem, if you buy into the old earth, and that is unlimited time and random selection is actually the method by which simple things, you know, one cell creatures, became complex things like human beings. You know, if you press and say, well, how does that happen? How do you start with a little creature like this and then it, and it becomes a, a, a human being? How does that happen? Their answer is, well, you know, uh, through a process of selection, you know, the, the strong survive, adaptation to climate, adaptation to surrounding, through randomness over millions and billions of years, eventually we get to the way that we are. 
Well, there are also other scientists who are mathemat uh, mathematicians and they tell us that there is a point in mathematical probability, meaning when it's, you know, if you have one, like if you like horse racing and you're a gambler and you, you know, there are seven horses in the race, you know, your odds are not, you know, one out of seven. You know, they're not great odds, but one out of seven, right? Presidential election, one out of two, you know. But when you start getting to one out of 10 million or one out of 500 million, mathematically, mathema mathematicians tell us when you get to those odds, well, what you're saying is it's impossible because there's a point where something becomes mathematically impossible, okay? So this business of you know, over billions of years, you know, one chance out of billions that uh, you know, this creature here evolved into this other creature, uh, mathematically it becomes impossible. So the odds that this universe was created by time and chance are so great that they cannot be expressed in numbers. That's, that's not an opinion, that's a stated fact. The odds that all of this came about through chance over millions of years, the odds against that are so great, they don't even, they, math, mathematicians don't even have a way to express the numbers. That's how impossible it is. And I've heard some guys you know, they make, they make the joke you know, that this universe you know, uh, was created by time and chance is about as possible as you take an electromagnet you know, and you drag it through a junkyard and you come out with a 747. <laughs> you know, we're laughing, right? We say, <laughs> do you know how much more complex the human body is than a 747? Now, for the earth to be a billion years old and for the evolutionary system to be the way that it happened also presents some observational problems. I was talking about philosoph philosophical problems, you know, nothing comes from nothing and all that, but there's also some observational problems. The genealogical record doesn't match the facts. That's one of the observational problems. Geologists are continually finding complex creatures at the rock levels where only simple creatures should be located according to their chart. As a matter of fact, every form of complex creature has been found in the lower layers when they are examining you know, layers of sediment. The best example is with dinosaurs who were supposed to have lived 300 million years before man, according to the, the diagram. But the most famous, famous contradiction of this were the tracts found in the Paluxy River in Texas, where in 1908, dinosaur tracts were found right next to human footprints. They were side by side. And these were authenticated in 1938 by a Dr. Roland Bird of the American Museum of Natural History. See what I'm saying here? In addition to these, there have been human footprints and carvings and tools and pottery found in rock layers supposedly 200 to 500 million years old. And that's, according to evolutionists, that's before man you know, evolved. So the idea is that if we're going to believe this stratified model where the simple creatures are at the bottom and they evolve to the top to complex creatures, well, how do you explain complex creatures being at the bottom with the simple ones and simple ones being at the top with the complex one? You know, if the, if the evolutionary uh, model is true, then there should be a fossil record showing how simple creatures transform from one species into a more complex species. These links have never been found. You know, you ever hear people talk about the missing link? You know, the missing link? Never mind about the missing link. There are millions of links 
that need to be there in order for the chain from one species to the other for that to be complete as a fact, in order to have evidence about that. And they have not found any of these links. I was talking to Kim Wall, we know Kim teaches a lot of classes on creationism, and he was telling me this story. He says, imagine if you wish, there's a pond, a big pond, okay? And you're you know, examining this pond, you're interested in nature and so on and so forth. And you go to the bottom of the pond in the mud, you know, at the bottom, what are you going to find? Well, you'll find slugs and you know, those kind of little creatures down there at the bottom of the pond. And then in the water, you know, there'll be fish and so on and so forth. And then when you get to the top of the pond, you know, there may be lily pads and there may be dragonflies flying around there at the top. You know, and if you go to the edge of the pond, you'll, you'll see some frogs. And, so, and if you go a little further away from the pond, smaller creatures, rodents and so on and so forth. You know, that, that's what you'll find. Now imagine if all of a sudden, wham, a million tons of mud just falls on that pond. You know, like if there was a worldwide flood. Okay. And that, and that pond was frozen in time in sediment. And then a thousand years later, scientists come along and they kind of carve, you know, they excavate it, they carve it like a cake you know, to kind of examine all the layers. And they're looking at it and say, well, look at that. Well, simple creatures right there at the bottom. And look at that. There are fish a little more complicated. Well, look at that. These, look, there are flying type of creatures at this level over here. And, and, and now we have mammals over here and we have more complex creatures. Wow. Well, so the, 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 the simple creatures evolved into these and these evolved into these. You could say that. But you could also say that all of these creatures, right, existed simultaneously in different environments. And they were frozen in time because of a catastrophic event that took place. Hmm, I wonder what catastrophic event took place that solidified you know, creatures uh, as, they, as they moved, as they lived. And so evolution and the old earth theory is good on paper, but the evidence in the earth itself, that is the geological findings, and the logical thinking don't really support it. It is the alternative answer for the origin of the universe for many people who actually just refuse to believe in God. Some people say, oh yeah, yeah preacher, you're a preacher, you're just saying that, but I'm not. A lot of people who buy into evolution do so because they just don't want to believe in a supreme being, in a God. And usually they don't want to believe in God because they don't want anybody to tell them what to do. They don't want, they don't want anybody to tell them how to live and what to do. So it's easier for them to hang on to this faulty model of how things came to be than to step into the light and accept the fact that there is a God. All right, what about the young earth? Need to move here. What about the young earth theory? Well, the young earth theory has many less obstacles and more proofs to support it. First of all, there are no philosophical problems with a young created earth. There's no contradictions here. There's no, you know, something comes from nothing, you know, matter is it, you don't have that problem. That an all powerful and wise being created the universe which reflects his complexity and wisdom, that's logical. That makes it, you don't have to believe that, but you can't say that that's illogical. That a more complex and powerful being created something less complex and less, comp, uh, less powerful than himself. As a matter of fact, the existence of an eternal God creating the earth can logically be demonstrated in a variety of ways. We talked about this at the very beginning when we talked about you know, why do people believe in God? You've got all kinds of arguments, you know, the moral argument, the first cause argument. So philosophically, you don't even need the Bible. Philosophically, you can make up, you can, you can have, you have access to many philosophical arguments uh, that bring you to the conclusion that there must be, uh, where does all this come from? Well, you know, there must be a cause, first cause. Now, the earth itself presents no observational contradiction to this model as well. For example, complex forms of life appear simultaneously at the earliest parts of all 
uh, and all throughout the geological evidence in the earth. And that is according, you know, if the earth was created, then you're going to find complex models and simple cell creatures together everywhere on earth. And that's exactly what you find everywhere on earth. Um, there, um, there are no uh, links from one form of life to another. You don't need to find a missing link because there are no links. Just like creation describes, only the same type of man from the beginning exists today. You know, if, if, we were, if we were able to see Adam, we would recognize him as a, a, human, as a human being. So man in the creation model, man is the same from beginning until now. Monkeys are the same from the beginning until now. There are no links to go from one to the other. Now, I need to make a little parenthetical statement here. There is a sort of evolution, microevolution, that takes place within a species of animal or insect or bird. Within a species, there is some evolutionary movement. I, I believe they call it microevolution. Within a species, yes. But there is no evidence that one species of creature evolves into a completely different species of creature. You know, a bird does not become a dog. That's, that's the simplest way as I can, as I can do it. So uh, with the young earth, with the creation model, you're not looking for missing links. Why? Well, there are no missing links. The earth is as God had created it. And what's interesting, what's interesting about this is they keep finding new species, don't they? they, all, they you know, scientists, they go, they go to the Amazon, find a type of monkey. The last one I heard was a, a little tiny monkey that they had no record of. A brand new species. Imagine that. And they find new species of birds and insects and so on and so forth. So all of this does not contradict in any way the model, the creation model that we see uh, in uh, Genesis. Also, there are over 70 ways to date the earth using various disciplines. There's not just carbon dating. There's a chemical dating, anthropological dating, archeological dating, and so on and so forth. And all of these methods suggest a young versus an old earth. Even carbon dating used by evolutionists, as I say, can only date as far back as so many years. And beyond that, they have to guess. And also, of course, we need to mention the Bible itself contains genealogical records that lists patriarchs from the first man until Moses, and then from Moses until Christ, that contain no more, no more than about 8,000 years of history, taking into account different gaps and calendar discrepancies and so on and so forth. You know, we can't date it to the day, but we're not talking millions of years. We're not even talking hundreds of thousands of years. We're talking about thousands of years. So a young earth model of about 10,000 years in that context there, is supported by logic. It's a logical thing that a complex, powerful God created the earth. It's supported by observation. We look at the Bible and it tells us how it happened. Then we looked at the earth and we observe and we see, yeah, yeah it's exactly how it, exactly, you know, one seed bearing after its own kind, one animal multiplying after its own kind. And also we have the, we have the added uh, opportunity of seeing this explained to us in the book of Revelation. Remember, uh, Jesus confirms the writing of Moses, and Moses is the one who wrote the book of Genesis. So through that connection we see that Jesus confirms the things that Moses wrote in Genesis. All right? Interesting that the people of Jesus' time there's never any question. They ask him about all kinds of things, don't they? But they never ask him about who made the earth or, you know, there's, it's assumed by the people of that time. All right. So the problem with accepting the young earth model, that's less than 10,000 years, which was the model supported by both science and religion until the 20th century. Until the 20th century, that was the model accepted. And some people say, oh, well, they were ignorant and so on and so forth. Really? Well, you know, Sir Isaac Newton, 
you know, gravity and all the scientists of his era, they accepted the idea that a supreme being created the earth. It's just in the last hundred years or so that the theory of evolution um, has begun to seriously uh, influence the world. This theory has found its way into schools and government and has undermined the belief uh, in the Bible. In the last 10 years or so, it has begun to crumble as evidence has built up to contradict and to destroy it, but the damage to faith has already been done. It's been great and it'll take time to undo. I mean, the libraries are full of books you know, you know, showing that chart. And I love the one you know, where you have the monkey and the, the ape and then the man, you know what I mean? That's a nice graphic, you know, but they've never proven, they've never shown any links between that. It just, you know, uh, they show the graphics and people who don't know any better you know, buy it you know, wholesale. All right, now we're not going to take a lot of time on, again, the creationism idea, just this class here, because it comes up. People want to know what does it mean in Genesis 1-1. And of course, we have people in this congregation so well, more you know, versed and certainly more well trained in talking about creationism. You know, they, could, uh, they could fill up 13 weeks talking just about that. But this course is about the book of Genesis, the entire book of Genesis. So starting next week, we're going to start you know, moving into the text itself and looking at the story. I will spend a, one more you know, period of time talking about those who try to reconcile Genesis 1 with evolution, you know, theistic evolution, stuff like that. We'll look at that uh, a little bit, but then we're going to move into the uh, text itself because this particular study is really going to be a textual study of the book of Genesis, looking at its themes and so on and so forth. Fascinating study, I hope you'll stay I hope you'll stay with it. All right, that's it for tonight. Thank you very much for your attention.